Welcome everyone. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'll get started in just a couple minutes, around two or three past, depending on numbers slowing down. And welcome everybody to a webinar about bisexual and pansexual youth and accessing comprehensive sexuality education. We're gonna get started in just one or two more minutes. Feel free to drop your name and any other information you'd like into the chat so we know who's here. I think we can do the chat. Liz, I'm saying the chat to everyone who's coming in, but I don't actually know in webinars if people can use the chat. Hello everyone and welcome. We'll be at Sarge in just another minute. Oh, everyone is telling me in the questions and answers that the chat is disabled. <laughs> Thank you everyone. <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, it's enabled now. Yay. Yay. Hi, Tracy. We're going to get started in one more minute. Hi, Fiona. Fiona's asking if we're going to be emailing a link to the recording after the presentation. And Jen says, yes, we'll be sharing a link. All right, it's three past. I say we should probably get started with our amazing webinar, not leave our guests waiting. I'm so excited to chat with everyone here. Um, as you're coming in, please feel free to share your name and any other information in the chat, and we will get started with introductions here on the screen as well. Um, first, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to the incredible art here on the screen and in the report. Thank you so much to Anusha Raichur, who might be here on the call and is supposed to be joining. So um, if we see her on the attendee list, make sure you say thank you so much for the incredible work. We're so honored to have her uh, illustrations bringing the appropriate amount of joy to the report. And I will stop sharing now so that you can see everyone else's beautiful faces. And here we all are. Pardon me while I set up my screen in the way that works the best for me. Excellent. All right, today we're gonna to start uh, by briefly sharing about this new project, introducing the report and the website, and then we're gonna to turn to our experts here to, to host a robust conversation about the impact of the erasure of bisexual and pansexual youth from comprehensive sexuality education and how inclusion would affect the lives of bisexual and pansexual youth across the globe. Finally, we'll have some time for a few questions from the audience, but please feel free throughout to drop questions in the chat or in the q and I'll be monitoring both as much time as, you know, as much as I can through also moderating the conversation here. Um, so please feel free to use the chat throughout. Before we do any of that, I'd like to take a few minutes to have our speakers introduce themselves. I will go first and then we'll each tell you our names, our pronouns, any org affiliations we have, and a little bit about our work as it relates to comprehensive sexuality education. My name is Heron Greensmith. I use they. I am the Senior Research Analyst for LGBTQI Justice here at Political Research Associates 
We are a strategy and think tank uh, center that researches the right wing in order to provide our sibling organizations with the information that they need to better bring about a uh, multiracial democracy. Very excited for that. I'm going to pass to Nicole. Can you introduce yourself to us? Hello, hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me well. My name is Nicole Holmes. I use she and sometimes they pronouns. Um, in a professional capacity, full time, I work as a manager of health equity for the uh, national HIV profit known as NASDAQ. Outside of that, I have about um, 12 years of um, sex education experience with um, educating youth and it did start when I was in undergrad so I you when it comes to sex ed if you name it I have essentially done it I have taught um, sex education to children in um, alternative high schools as well as juvenile justice programs in addition to um, just teaching comprehensive uh, sex education in general as well as throughout multiple states and kind of navigating uh, various sexuality education laws. I also have a bit of experience teaching puberty education. Thank you all for having me. Thank you so much, Nicole. I am just, I'm already excited for this conversation, just hearing about your work. Um, Anmol, will you introduce yourself next? Yes, thank you, Haram. Uh, hi, I'm Anmol, and uh, I my pronouns are they and them. And uh, I'm from the YP Foundation India, um, and I am a sexuality educator, and I work as the program coordinator uh, at the YP Foundation in Know Your Body, Know Your Rights program. So we essentially work with adolescents and young people and engage with them uh, on um, different sexual and reproductive health and rights, thematics of sexual and reproductive health and rights from a pleasure affirmative uh, lens and from a justice-based lens. So yeah, really excited to be here and share the space with all of you. Thank you so much, Emma. Brooke, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Heron. Hi, everybody. My name is Brooke Hugley. I am currently based in Northampton, Mass., uh, but initially I am from Texas, Austin, Texas. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at Collective Power for Reproductive Justice. We are a national reproductive justice organization at Collective Power. I am the programs manager of the campus and conference program. My job is really organizing and directing our annual reproductive justice conference that is mainly for young youth activists and students to really learn about everything that's going on right now in the world of abortion politics, post Dobbs, trans and queer liberation right now, healing justice, reproductive justice, disability justice. Um, yeah, uh, I'm also an artist and an embodiment worker and a yoga teacher. So that's a little bit about me. Amazing, amazing. And then Salai, will you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Silai Tashrifa. I work at IPAS Africa Alliance. IPAS is an organization that focuses on reproductive justice, where we want to ensure that women and girls have access to abortion services. And um, of course, it will include CAC, amongst other reproductive justice issues. We also ensure commodity security for safe abortion services by working with facilities, both public and private. I go with she, her, and I work as a senior policy advisor based in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much, Soleil. And I think y'all understand why I'm so excited about this conversation right now. Um, before we get to talk to our incredible experts, I'd love to take a little moment to share about the report and how it came about, and then maybe walk you through a little bit of the, um, the report itself on the webpage so you can follow along with us as we talk about it. Um, I'd also like to thank IPASS, obviously, as one of the major partners on the report, um, the publisher and uh, the host of today's webinar. Thank you so much. I dropped IPASS's link along with the links to the other organizations into the chat. So please check out all of these. Make sure you're supporting these incredible uh, reproductive justice and um, sexual health and rights organizations, please. All right. So um, about a year ago, Paige Logan from IPASS met and began talking about this uh, project in the early in the early days of it. Um, we 
knew that we wanted to talk about youth's access to comprehensive sexuality education. And since it was Pride, we decided to talk about queer youth um, and then finally narrowed it down to the largest population of queer youth, which are bisexual and pansexual youth. Um, Paige brings her incredible knowledge of um, uh, reproductive self of sex and <laughs> what is SRHR? Sexual health and reproductive rights. It's not my acronym. I use LGBT as a domestic person. So I, I'm getting used to the, the international acronyms as well. Um, uh, Paige, thank you so much, Jen. Paige's incredible SRHR knowledge and then my knowledge coming from bi and pan movements combines together to make like the perfect um, uh, research question. Um, and then we were able to answer those questions um, through our incredible uh, interviews with our youth and our advocates and educators. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So we are, the, the point of our research was to describe the current landscape of comprehensive sexual education for bisexual and pansexual youth to determine how exclusion from comprehensive sexual education impacts bisexual and pansexual youth, particularly their access to health information and health services. And then finally, to explore the role of anti-rights rhetoric in comprehensive sexual ed sexuality education and how that rhetoric helps marginalize bisexual and pansexual youth in their efforts to access comprehensive sexuality education. Um, in order to investigate these questions, we conducted 18 interviews across the globe um, from eight different countries, Ghana, Kenya, the United States, Philippines, Indonesia, Brazil, the United Kingdom and Nigeria. We talked with nine young people between the ages of 19 and 24, all of whom identified as bisexual and or pansexual, and nine advocates and educators between the ages of 24 and 50, who had between one and 22 years of experience, either advocating for or teaching comprehensive sexuality education to youth, most of whom I believe identified also as bisexual or pansexual. Our young people were um, very varied broadly in their sexual orientation and gender identity. We have cisgender females, gender questioning people, males, non-binary trans people, and non-binary women. Three of our young people identified as trans. Um, we also have broad racial and ethnic identities represented, including Black, Caribbean American, Filipino Mexican, White, Irish, Sunamese, and West Java. And then our advocates and educators also varied very widely among their gender identities. And among racial and ethnic identities, we have African, West African, Ghanan, Botha, Indigenous Mexican, Luya, and White. I'll pause there and begin our conversations with our um, panelists that I want to throughout sprinkle in our findings and our um, recommendations. But please, I see that Jen has been dropping in the, the link to the report itself. Please check out the report as we're talking um, and then stick any questions in the chat. And if you haven't yet introduced yourself in the chat, please feel free to say hi. Um, I am going to move to Brooke and Anmol first, and I'd love to hear your reactions to the project, how it intersects with your work and your experience as younger people who either were or perhaps were not able to access comprehensive sexuality education and then I was wondering if there was anything that stuck out to you, resonated with you, surprised you either personally or professionally. And I'll start with Anmol. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, it's a beautiful report uh, just to start with. Um, but yes, definitely uh, when I was going through it, there were so many uh, things that I thought were also that, like, there was so much resonance when I was um, going through the report. And um, one thing that really struck was, and one of the uh, findings that you have is that because of, um, uh, you know, uh, the lack of um, engagement when we are even um, speaking of comprehensive sexuality education, the lack, lack of engagement with these identities, uh, when we speak about bisexual identities or pansexual identities, um, it's it's it really affects the kind of access 
uh, to information about reproductive rights and sexual health and rights uh, to so many uh, uh, queer folks. And uh, one thing that also um, was really clear from the work that I do here in India with different communities um, and the report that I read, the, the resonance, uh, was also that uh, we usually focus on engaging with queer folks about their uh, reproductive health and rights and giving them the information, the information dissemination process is that, okay, so uh, because we understand that there are, uh, you know, um, unique health uh, uh, you know, uh, requirements uh, or experiences that queer folks have, uh, we speak to them. But it's so important to have these conversations in larger communities uh, so that they can become the norm. Because we speak about cishet health uh, very, very normally. Uh, and we engage in those conversations very normally. So why not also speak about queer experiences and queer health um, with communities at large and not just focus on giving the information to queer folks so that when support is required, um, uh, everybody can come together. And, and this will also finally hopefully someday will affect the way policies are designed uh, around health. Um, so yeah, just wanted to really um, flag that and um, really uh, enjoyed reading the report and there was so much resonance there, yeah. Thank you, Anmol. Brooke, I see you nodding a lot. Yeah, no, nodding a lot, like plus one in my, in my head. Um, I also want to just reiterate how beautiful the report was and how much resonance I had while engaging with it and almost like it was healing to my uh my like teenage angsty self who really was grappling with a lot of what it meant to be queer and had no idea I grew up in Texas I was homeschooled and in the communities that I was existing in by and pan people were not talked about queer people weren't talked about and so I think this report really hit home for me in the ways that we are invisibilized. Um, and then I'm also, what really stuck out to me and something that I feel like I've been pulling a lot out in my own work is this idea of overlapping oppressions and especially for queer folks of color, the ways that oppression compounds and then impacts one's access to health and reproductive care. Um, that really stuck out to me and just has me thinking a lot about the ways that racism trickles down and impacts um, our our sexual experience, sexual orientation. Um, yeah, so also just the art was so beautiful and just a wonderful pairing. Um, so just want to reiterate that. And I really, really appreciate it just getting to spend time, uh, spend time with the report. Thank you so much, you two. I want to highlight a couple of the findings in the report before we move on to speaking with Nicole next. Um, you know, we we found that unsatisfied with their school-based comprehensive sexuality education, youth seek information elsewhere. They turn to the internet, they turn to their peers, they turn to porn, they turn to other professionals that they can find, they turn to their parents. Um, we also found that discrimination experiences were similar throughout the world. Bisexual and pansexual youth face erasure of their sexual orientation. They face harmful misinformation about their identities. This discrimination and this harmful misinformation lead bisexual and pansexual youth to experience pervasive doubt and uncertainty. And there's a significant lack of funding and sensitivity training that impacts comprehensive sexuality programs and educators, plus opposition to CSE and LGBTQ rights that causes widespread mental and emotional harm. Thus, coming to the conclusion that, inclus that inclusive CSE that addresses bi and pan identities directly and needs would have enormous mental and physical health impacts on the youth being. Um, educated at the moment and then as they grow into adulthood. Nicole, I would love, uh, as you're listening to others' experiences and looking at the report, I'd love to hear how you think educators can support bisexual and pansexual youth in the classroom and to what extent it is a teacher's responsibility, for example, instead of the responsibility of those who are setting curricula. 
um, what might you say to other teachers and educators who hope to offer inclusive, comprehensive CSE? Well, I'm going to start with pushback because I believe that it absolutely is the responsibility of curricula developers to, um, first of all, acknowledge bisexual and pansexual youth. So um, before I get on the soapbox here, just want to take a step back. But yes, it absolutely is a responsibility because what happens is even if you have um, a well-attended teacher, someone who may have even read this report and may understand the importance of naming bisexual and pansexual youth. Let's say, for example, you happen to be working off of a curricula that may even be inclusive to LGBTQ folks. However, it doesn't specifically name bisexual and pansexual youth. People are going to pick up on that when you go, you know, shake and bake. And I helped when you treat bisexual and pansexual youth as if they are a footnote that's gonna have a direct effect on how they receive the sexual health information. Um, that's gonna directly affect if they feel as though someone is uh, speaking directly to them. And Brooke, actually, I'm so glad that you brought up Texas because part of my question is to provide resources. Um, there are some folks that I just wanna make sure that we are just shouting out folks that are doing their best to advocate for these changes. So right now, um, CECUS, as well as the Texas Freedom uh, Network e Education Fund, I will go ahead and drop a quick little link in the chat. They are calling for um, a report to overhaul the state's sex education standards for the first time since the 90s. So on the one hand, for the first time since the 90s, on the other hand, there's no time like the present, so there's a bit of balance here and there, but um, I absolutely believe it's on the curricular educators. Sure, let's see, let me get that for you, because I do not know it off the top of my head. I'm gonna be real about that. Nicole, I believe that they used to be, um something sexuality information education council but now they are simply the United States. yeah just like um, NASA. yep and uh nicole dropped the link oh to hosts and panelists i'll drop that to everyone here we go thank you nicole absolutely absolutely um Let's see. What I would say to other teachers and educators is the same thing I would say. Um, of course, we are focusing on bio pan youth today, but it's the same thing I would say to anyone who is uh, attempting to advocate on behalf of a community that they do not belong to. It's always sit down at the seat, sit down at the table, take a look. I need you to immediately make note of who is there and who is not there. So when you're advocating on behalf of bi and pan youth, uh, number one, we're bi and pan um, sexuality educators, we're bi and pan subject matter expert in general, such as myself. I am a sex educator, but I am also a bi plus person. So were they involved in the curricular development? Were they, um, were they uh, consulted at all about best practices from a professional and as much as they are interested in sharing personal um, standpoint? There's lots of resources that um, are in place to be able to support this. I want to make sure I shout out uh, one name that I actually saw on the call. I don't know this person personally, but I've seen enough of their names involved with the emails with the organization. Uh, we have Caitlin Vicker in the house from Advocates for Youth. So I want to make sure I'm always shouting out Advocates for Youth um, because, first of all, they involve youth within their um, organizational structure. They involve youth actively as change makers. Um, I think that's something I can also tell teachers and educators, making sure that you are involving youth in the process, because once again, going back to that footnote piece, if someone is actively involved in their planning process, if someone is actively involved in being able to give that feedback, that increases the ability of them to be able to see themselves in the actual curricula and be able to make the best decisions for themselves. And I wanna make sure that it's absolutely clear, um, especially someone in the public health field. Sometimes we have a nice little manual, a nice little packet of things that we may want to say as far as what we think someone may need. But if we don't focus on what I call my favorite principle Kwanzaa, uh, my favorite Kwanzaa principle, which is Kuja Chagalia, or self-determination, then we are not really, the information is not really 
being absorbed as well if we're telling communities or we're telling folks what we think they need versus allowing communities to be able to come in or people within communities, because we always want to go people first, to be able to come in and tell us what they need. I also want to make sure that I'm always shouting out as far as policy change is concerned too, the Gutmacher Institute. I'm going to definitely make sure I'm always shouting them out as well. Thank you, Nicole. I'm going to go off script a little bit here and ask a follow up question. Um, wondering if you think there's a how here for including bisexual and pansexual youth more, whether it's earlier in the in the curricular development, whether there's, you know, a way that an organization that has access to curricular development processes can involve bi and pan youth. How is the mechanism for we, how we can implement the recommendations in the report? Thank you for that question. The how I think always comes back to go to the experts. And I do want to make sure that I'm calling myself out here too. Uh, the resources that I've given you have mainly been big names, lots of, um, well, I don't want to say lots of, because I'm sure the folks that, you know, work there would definitely give you back and forth as far as like funding, but folks that do have funding behind their name, folks that do have clout behind their name, but also don't want to take away from grassroots as well. So um, as much as you can, um, thinking like local um, LGBTQ community centers as well, I'm going to send you another um, link if you are interested in local LGBTQ um, community centers, that would be Centerlink. So this will be um, a conglomerate essentially of LGBTQ organizations that um, are all within this one community to be able to find folks that are doing more grassroots work. And then also asking around, word of mouth is never dead, it has never died. So I wanna make sure that we're also honoring that as well. But the how I think comes down to as early as possible in the planning process. So um, one thing that I absolutely want to um, make sure I am shouting out uh, that I didn't, which shame on me, bisexuals, pansexuals, <laughs> the actual organizing, um, the actual folks that are doing the organizing arms. I just sent you uh, a link for the um, by Resource Center, I also want to make sure I'm sending other links as well, such as the uh, Bi Organizing Project. We have lots of Bi Plus, well, not lots of, but we have Bi Plus folks that are doing work um, across the country, the folks that are doing work internationally, we want to make sure that we're honoring and uplifting the voices of Bi people within their um, own circles. I want to shout out one of my colleagues on the call, Fiona Dawson, we've done um, a bit of work behind the scenes with uh, Bi Plus Organizing US to be able to uplift this kind of work as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think I can sum up everything that I want to say as far as nothing about us without us. Shout out to Fiona. She just dropped a bunch of links in the chat for Give Out Day. So ensuring that we are um, giving what we can as well as sharing our resources to those who may be able to best support this or the organizations because as much as we may all have all the steam on earth to do this work we live in a capitalist society we need the funding we want to make sure we're always honoring and uplifting that thank you so much nicole and thank you to everyone for the links on the side i also pasted in the link to the um recommendation resources for advocates and, and uh, educators that was in the last page of our report. We have a list of seven different resources here for supporting bisexual and pansexual youth. Um, so I want to pull that in um, to the report as well. Thank you so much, Nicole. Back to Brooke and Mull. we've talked a little bit about your experiences and then heard from Nicole about how this work might fit both into a teacher's responsibility to include folks in the classroom and obviously for curriculum developers to include folks as early as possible um, in the timeline. Again, to emphasize, bisexual and pansexual youth comprise the majority of LGB youth in the United States and in other countries surveyed around the globe. Um, I think current data shows that as, as much as 13% of girls surveyed identify as bisexual, we're talking multiples more than other sexual orientations here. Um, 
Brooke and Anmol, where do you see yourselves and other advocates specifically in the coordinated campaign to support bisexual and pansexual youth in comprehensive sexuality education? And of course, we all smiled a little bit because there is no coordinated campaign to include bisexual and pansexual youth in comprehensive sexuality education. Um, so I guess, what could that look like? And then, yeah, where do you see yourselves as advocates? Brooke, I'll go to you first this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to lift up something Nicole said about us living in a capitalist <laughs> society um, and just like the importance of naming that, I think, when we're thinking about this work and thinking about, like Karen, like you said, the giggle, <laughs> the thought of a campaign. And I'm like, how amazing would it actually be to have a campaign? And how can we really think outside of capitalism and white supremacist structures that lean us into urgency and that don't allow us to create uh, comprehensive sexuality programs that are by and for us. So I'm thinking a lot about where I see myself on the campaign. Um, and I'm thinking about inclusion and I'm thinking about visibility first um, as kind of the major things. Um, and, you know, I think that we need more experiences to share our stories. We need more inclusive language and less stigma. And so, and we need like allyship and advocates. And so I'm thinking about all of that in my positionality to the campaign. campaign. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking, especially right now, we, a lot of my work is looking at convening, convening in conversation. And those conversations have to be intergenerational, but they also can't be expecting youth to be the ones that are going to be leading them and um, forging the work forward. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts, <laughs> but where I see myself on the campaign is as an advocate and somebody that's not looking to youth to solve the issues, um, but is looking to bring them in to stand in solidarity with, to put their perspectives and their experiences at the forefront, um, but in a really thoughtful way that is not exploiting or tokenizing, which is something I really want to appreciate and lift up that the report highlighted as a recommendation. Um, and so I just think with this work, we really have to um, just be really intentional um, because we, since we do live in capitalism, the urge to go into exploitation and urgency and flight or fight is so there. Um, so that was kind of a bit of a scramble, but that's, that's where I, where I'm at. And, and while I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Brooke. Um, yeah, I, I think that like my thoughts are in total alignment with yours uh, right now, but um, and definitely uh, like what you said about inclusion and inclusive language, especially um, that is so important, I think, like for a campaign, if there is ever a cam campaign uh, that we start, um, it, it's so important to also uh, understand the power of English uh, when we speak about queerness and that uh, all communities, uh, like we have queer folks everywhere, um, but just that the language uh, that we get stuck with and even, even we find it so difficult to disseminate information um, and to really just talk about queerness when it is not in English. Um, so that is something that is so, so important uh, that we need to bring uh, the, the importance of inclusive language um, and also to really speak about um, the power dynamics that exist within queer circles. Um, I, I think that that is also very important, especially when we speak about um, as Nicole said, that we are existing in a capitalist um, um, structure. So just the power dynamics that exist everywhere around us and then within queer circles as well. Um, and especially, uh, I mean, when we, um, I'm speaking from my experiences uh, since I'm from India, and then we have uh, uh, 
diversity based on religion, caste, class, um, and just like so many language. Um, and then like where you're from, like geographically placed in India. So, um, and that really brings out the struggle. So talking about not just speaking about um, BIPAN erasure um, as an overarching uh, theme, but really looking into it with the intersection of other identities and where those identities place the BIPAN folks um, in, in uh, the spectrum uh, or in the system. So that is so important. Yeah, that is what I would uh, bring to the campaign and really beautifully framed, uh, uh, Brooke, that like it, it's so important to not put the onus on youth, uh, the entire onus on youth, um, but really to bring them and not use their uh, experiences as mere stories, but really bring their experiences out and and speak about our experiences as well and as as sexuality educators as programmers uh who are designing comprehensive sexuality education curricula uh it's so important for all of us also to explore our own queerness when we are engaging with uh with uh young people and and to leave that space for us as well that exploration space not just to tell them uh what queerness means to to when we are holding that space for them that they can define that for themselves why not also explore it ourselves so yeah can i just add a little bit to that too oh please yeah. absolutely so, can so I one just, thing oh i'm, sorry, I'm, not, ahead, I'm, I'm so yeah, sorry go just, ahead Thanks, Nicole. Actually, just wanted to give a shout out here uh, to one of my colleagues and really dear friend, Aparupa, who, uh, who also spoke about this point of really, um, like, as educators, exploring our own queerness. So, and thanks, Nicole, for giving so many shout outs. I, I felt that I, I needed to give that here. So, yeah. Always got to uplift those doing the work. Thank you, Anmal. So I just wanted to, um, well, one thing that I wanted to do is just really honor both Brooke and Anmal, as well as the report itself, for the intentionality behind um, ensuring that youth are involved, but not the ones expected to lead the charge. That shows not only um, thoughtfulness behind uh, the importance of their involvement without forcing them to come up with the work, but it also shows um, an intentionality behind wanting to uh, support and protect those who are most vulnerable among us. So I definitely uh, wanna honor that. And then also just wanted to wrap it uh, up, at least on my thoughts of saying like one thing that I don't think has been mentioned as much is recognizing um, recognizing your privilege, whether that be in the privilege of being in, um, a person who is living in this world as a white person or a person who is um, in this space because we are focusing on um, youth, a person who may be in a position um, of power as it turn, like as it comes to you. So just always making sure that you are being as intentional as possible and as thoughtful as possible with just recognizing the many ways in which, in which your power and privilege might show up within this space. And speaking of power and privilege, um, I'm an opposition monitor. I knew it was really important to look at the opposition to comprehensive sexuality education around the world. Um, and so I will turn to Salai and ask, with the rise in authoritarianism and the rise in anti-rights advocacy, anti-queer advocacy around the world, um, can you give us a look at what you're seeing in your work in Africa? Yeah, sure. Like um, doing opposition monitoring in Africa, I'm seeing like a lot of disinformation around CAC by anti-rights organizations. And they're doing like a lot of mobilization targeting parents specifically and weaponizing children in the, in the agenda against CAC. So for example, the 
um, the most, some of the, mo the messages that are coming out, uh, allegedly CSC is out to sexualize children and it will promote promiscuity. So the message that anti-rights organizations are putting outside there to parents in the African region is that they shouldn't embrace CSC because it's against their culture. It will sexualize children and it will promote promiscuity promiscuity, something that I always wonder whether it's true because then Africa has a culture where grandparents or even aunties ideally are supposed to give sexual education to their children to, as you grow up, their key role is to make sure that you have the right information around sexuality and that you know things around sexual health, reproductive rights, uh, etc. But anti-rights organizations apart from that are actively challenging issues around policies that would promote um, CSC in most of the African uh, regions. Our, a good example is that currently we are having an East African Community Reproductive Health Bill and organizations like Citizen Go are working together closely with Family Watch International to send out memorandums to meet the East African Legislative Assembly with one clear message that the fact that the bill contains or provides space for CSC, then it is a Western agenda that goes against the local culture and traditions which is ironic <laughs> that it is Western Christian national, nationalists like Family Watch International that are pushing and mobilizing anti-rights organizations in Africa to object CSC in Africa. We are also seeing um, organization mobilizing key policymakers, as I've already mentioned, and technical technical line ministries, individuals, professionals, like that ideally should have the data, st statistics, uh, the will to push for CSC, but opposition organizations right now are working closely with them. Uh, the Ministry of Health, for example, the Ministry of Education, mobilizing them, advocating to them, and putting them in the forefront to advocate against CSC. And this has resulted to countries like Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, who had committed to the ESA commitment, the Eastern and Southern African commitments of health, education, and well being of young people actually pulling out of the commitments. We've also seen a lot of pushback at not just African level, but we've seen anti rights organizations mobilizing African youths, African policymakers, people from the Ministry of Education to engage at the UN. Uh, for example, the just recent 75th World Health Assembly we saw uh, anti-rights organizations mobilizing young people to go speak against CSC and how it is against our culture and how they do not uh, buy into CSC uh, because of the reasons that I've already mentioned. And uh, lastly, I would like to mention that one of the key narratives, the messaging that's cutting across all their anti-rights organizations and all their anti-rights individuals is that CSC will make our families disappear because then uh, CSC will teach our children about homosexuality and it will expose them to promiscuity. So that's the message that they're preaching everywhere they go that when we do away with CSC, then or if we embrace CSC, then we'll be able, our families will disappear. So by doing away with CSC, then we are protecting our families, we are protecting our culture, we are protecting our values. So thank you. No, thank you so much. I see everyone nodding. I don't know if there's any immediate reactions to what Salai is sharing, but it, to me, it just underscores the importance of including youth at every step of the process, right? So that we are making sure that we are informed by them, as Nicole is saying, but not making them stand in front and, and proclaim why this is important. Um, that's our job. Um, anyone want to respond to Salai before we move on to the last couple questions? Awesome, let's just move on to some, I'm gonna combine the last couple so we have time for 
um, some questions from the audience. So anyone who has questions in the audience, please either type them in the chat and I'll notice them or into the Q&A um, function directly. But this last question <laughs> is going to be kind of jammed together. I want to thank Nicole for making sure that we talk about the vicarious and direct trauma that it comes from being queer people, being bisexual and pansexual people, doing this work advocating for our own well-being and the well-being of people who were like us when we were young. Um, and then dovetailing or perhaps contraposing with that, it is the end of pride in a very uncertain and tenuous time here in many of the countries around the world that our respondents came from. How can we celebrate the beauty and resistance and resilience and joy of bisexual and pansexual communities? Um, Nicole, I'll go to you first if that's okay. Um, and feel free to talk about the trauma or talk about the joy, either one, we'll get to all of them. Well, uh, I always try to keep a balance. So if I'm gonna talk about the blues, I'm gonna make sure I talk about the rhythm as well. So um, just, honoring the fact that we are here and have not given up. I wanna make sure that we take the opportunity to sit with that. And um, I'm actually going to go a little left here and send another resource that is not necessarily LGBTQ specific, but I wanna make sure that I'm honoring the message behind this which is um, there's an organization called the Nat Ministry and they operate with the mantra of rest being resistance. So um, as you find yourself in this work, I'm, I'm sure many of us have heard the phrase, you can't pour into others from an empty cup. So ensuring that while we are in this work, um, especially for those who are developing curricula and didn't really see themselves initially, I'm sure it is probably bringing up some painful experiences and memories. Um, and hopefully it's bringing up a bit of hope that with each generation, as, as long as we continue to work too, because I don't think that we should just be like, oh, there's hope for the future, especially given what Sai just shared about what well, folks who are maybe within um, doing opposition work, but shout out to you, um, Aaron, for being involved in opposition monitoring, which folks that are within that work, um, are mobilizing will continue to mobilize so i don't think that we should just once again the youth have got it we're done we, we should never be in that space because we should be offering that support without trying to speak over youth and also making sure we're involving them in a way that doesn't um force them to be the only ones that are actively involved in this work so essentially ensuring that everyone that is involved with this work has rest as much as they can. Uh, once again, that goes into recognizing privilege, recognizing who has the um, brunt of the work, recognizing who is often um, pushed to the front to be the face of the work. Are they being, once again, uh, thinking from a capitalist perspective, are they being properly compensated for that and not in just um, hugs and pizza parties? So just thinking about um, being as intentional as possible in how we're showing up for not only this work, but showing up for ourselves. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sly, I will go to you to see if you have anything to share about joy or resistance in this in this difficult time. Yeah, I to me, I feel like uh, working with the young people in the development of the curriculum, uh, we need to take into account, especially in Africa, the needs of the bi and pansexual youths, because most times it's never intentional, we never think about them, we'll just say, oh, young people need a curriculum, let's mobilize young people to come in and develop the curriculum. I feel like it's also important to be intentional to make sure that we are reaching out to them and that they are intentionally contrib contributing to the CSC curriculum, especially the ones here in Africa. And I feel like this report is quite rich and in my work doing opposition monitoring, I'll intentionally make sure that as, as I do a mitigation on opposition attacks, this is a message that I'm going to pass out to the policymakers that I'm engaging with, the journalists that I'm hopefully are going to change the narrative with time while they while I give them the right message and when they send it out to the masses that will be listening. Well, now I'm in tears because that sounds exactly what this report should be used for. So thank you so much for that. Um, 
Anmo, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about joy or how we can minimize the trauma as bi and pan people working in this traumatic world? Yeah, uh, I I think that uh, like uh, uh, of course like uh, uh, acknowledging and echoing everything that Nicole and that I have uh, shared so far. Uh, one thing that is uh, so important is uh, uh, like uh, along with taking them along with us in that journey and really listening to their needs. It's also important for us to uh, to to acknowledge that this is a laborious and an exhausting process for um, the developers and for um, for for everyone who's a part of 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 this process. So it's it's important to also keep our emotions in check and to have space for rest and leisure at the same time and to really celebrate um, the joys and to to just maybe uh, sh celebrate shared experiences because a lot of times um, and this has been my experience in sharing circles it becomes a space to share vulnerability which is so so beautiful but a lot of times that vulnerability also comes out in ways of sharing grief because those spaces are 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 not very openly available for uh queer folks and for bi and pan folks so um because there is so much invisibility to also create those spaces in a to create some pocket joy in in those spaces is so important and and just bring out the importance of rest and leisure and self-care and to not always take that labor upon ourselves that we have to do this maybe leave some labor for others also <laughs> because um it, because a lot of emotional labor falls upon us uh to to a to to understand explore and then explain also to other folks so maybe the explanation bit can fall upon like others so that they can do their own research and understand and i hope that 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 starts happening more often but yeah that, that is so important to tell people uh to tell our young friends that it's okay for you to step back and not not engage in conversations that are really, uh, exhausting and laborious. For you. Thank you so much, Amal. That really struck home for me, just the, the need to pass off, whether it's to comrades or to like-minded folks, just to pass off some of the labor so that we can rest sometimes. Um, and thank you for sharing the rest of the NAP ministry. Um, Nicole, also a huge devotee of the NAP ministry. Before we get to Brooke um, and we're wrapping up, I wanted to make sure that we covered a little bit of the recommendations here in the report. So on the third page, we've developed six recommendations here. They're pretty straightforward. Nothing's gonna surprise you here. First is develop inclusive, comprehensive sexuality curricula. Second is to evaluate curricula for their effectiveness within bi and pan uh, communities. And the third is to ensure that CSE covers interpersonal communication skills for youth of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Um, fourth is to help students understand intersectionality, oppression, how they're personally impacted. The fifth is to support youth-led advocacy initiatives without expecting young people to do it all themselves, as we keep saying today. And then finally, to fund organizations doing bi and pan inclusive CSE and trust them to know what bi and pan students need. And we've shared the GoFundMe links or the um, Give Out Day links for the organizations, the buy and pan organizations here in the United States. I will share those again. And then if you have any links to buy and pan organizations that are your favorite, let's share those in the chat as well. Because these are all just domestic organizations and I know there's some around the world as well. And then I'm gonna pass to Brooke to give us the last word on resilience and healing from traumas, doing this work. 
Yeah. Bring us home. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have one point that I think can close us out. I'm really thinking about um, the importance of us being our radical queer selves and really like being within that being vigilant about making sure we're taking care of ourselves, knowing what we're up against. And I think there's real ways, very real tangible ways that we can be in space together. We can support each other and we can make that at safe. <laughs> safe is a weird word right now. Um, I'm thinking about another word for that, but we can make that a container that we feel liberated in. And so I'm just really thinking about the community networks of support and the ways that we need allies to show up at queer events to literally be the armor. You know, we need that because if we're going to keep doing this work and be in this fight, we need to know that people have our backs and the longevity of it. And we need to know that, you know, we're going to be, we need to know we can convene and be together um, and be in our joy. And I just want to like lift up everything that all these amazing panelists said, because I'm just like really sitting with that and thinking about the importance of our rest and our healing in this work because this fight is it's a lot it's draining and it it will take you out if it can sweep you out if you let it overwhelm you um and so i'm just thinking that send, ending on a note of resilience and joy is just so important um and centering it is so important because we are so important thank you so much rook that is a powerful last word um i will pause for another 30 seconds or so for folks to drop any questions or last affirmations into the chat. Tracy is saying, we're here for you. You're not alone. Allyship. Want to, oh, Fiona says, will you send the link? When you send the link to the recording, can you please send us all the links you dropped in the chat? I will leave that to iPass to figure out, but I don't see how that, that um, could be a, a major problem. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, and, you know what, one thing we can do to give us all a little rest, I know it's a tiny micro rest, but we could end early and then we could all have three minutes to spare. Nicole is, yes, vociferously nothing. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Let's honor our time by ending early today. Thank you so much for everyone who showed up. Three minutes to meditate, says Fiona. Emily says, thank you. Mauro says, thank you. Thank you so much to all of our incredible speakers. Thank you again to Anusha Rachur, who did their incredible art for the report. I will drop the report again in the, in the chat. Please take a look, send it to all of your networks. If you are doing comprehensive sexuality education, curricular development, please let us know, hit us up with an email or talk about the report. Thank you so much, everyone, and have an excellent morning, night, afternoon, middle of the day. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Bye -bye. Thank you, Emma. Thank, Thank you, Salai. Thank you, Nicole.